what else did I, I had something I was thinking about too there about oh about about the feeling it was to be called out in the middle of the night in a dark rainy night. It was always called out in rain or, or in a bad rainy night and to come out into cold with dark with no lights, no electricity and stop a train because of a washout or something down the line or to change his meat. And those old trains, they'd come, those old steam engines would come down the trail. And there'd be just a speck of light on the horizon and all of a sudden it'd come out just bigger and bigger and bigger. In the winter months you could hear them their sound would carry for long distance, but if it was storming, why well, they'd be right on top of you before you'd get them stopped. You'd wonder if that big old thing would stop or not. And it was just a, the thrill of having a great big machine like that all of a sudden come at you and you're right there holding up orders and you're within three feet of the machine and boom. <laughs> have always fascinated Americans, no doubt partly because of their awesome size and power. They seem to embody progress, speed, spectacle, and danger. But for many older people, especially in the rural Midwest, the railroads also have a deeper meaning. Trains and tracks were an important part of their daily lives, fueling their childhood fantasies and furnishing the incidents for their most vivid memories. This program isn't really about trains and railroads. It's about what our parents and grandparents remember about life along the tracks, about what trains and railroads mean to them. Before the railroads crossed the Mississippi in 1855, Iowa was mostly wilderness. In order to spur development, Congress gave the railroads huge tracts of land in the prairie states. The railroads sold this land to farmers from the east and from abroad, luring them with low land prices and promises of rich, stone and stump free soil. Railroads opened up the Great Plains for large scale agriculture by giving farmers easy access to eastern markets. Just two decades after the first tracks crossed the Mississippi, there were so many freight depots in Iowa that a farmer anywhere in the state could deliver crops to the railroad by horse and wagon and return home in a single day. To farming communities in the 19th century, the railroad spelled instant prosperity. Most towns did everything in their power to attract them. Those that didn't were soon sorry. The town of Kissaka, well, unfortunately, at the time the railroad came through in 1857, would not put any money into bringing the railroad into the county seat, and so the railroad, in all their glory, bypassed the town. And eventually the townspeople wanted to be on a railroad, and they were most important in those days because it's how the produce was moved uh, largely and how the products were shipped in from the east and the south. They, they had to have a, these railroads or flop they did. So a bunch of citizens in the county got together, put together what became known as the Ribbon of Rust. It ran from the little town of Summit into Kiyosakwa. It's probably the only place in the world where the train run in and backed out. And I suppose that was somehow the rudder was a way to keep their skirts clean. Besides prosperity, railroads meant progress. The railroads linked rural communities to the outside world. New products came by train, everything from rough lumber to fine tableware. The mail came by train. The railway post office picked up the mail, sorted it, and dropped it off for the next day delivery, all on the fly. The railroads brought the news, too. The only thing that carried information faster than the tracks was the telegraph. And telegraph wires follow the tracks. And, of course, the trains took people wherever they wanted to go. We had a passenger train running between Waterloo and Hudson that you could get on at Hudson in the morning, ride to Waterloo, and shop all day and come home in the afternoon or evening. And you could get off at either the east side of the river or the west side of the river, which both had all of your main shopping stores. And at that time in 1960, 
it was still only 25 cents for the round trip. Today, the railroads carry very little besides bulk freight. 90% of Iowa's rail traffic consists of just four things, farm products, food products, coal, and chemicals. But that wasn't always the case. When I started railroading in 1948, we used to ship practically anything that uh, could be found. We shipped uh, rabbits, dogs, chickens, turtles, uh, everything by express went with express messengers and they had food and water provided by the owners and the uh, messengers took care of the animals or the livestock as they were shipped. We used to haul milk for the farmers. They had to, they'd build a little dock at the crossing and they'd come up and bring it up in wagons and they'd unload this milk and we'd pick it up. We also hauled uh, Railroad Express and uh, the mail. Now those turtles were packed in a big barrel with their heads pointing away from each other and they were layered in there, one on top of each other. And the uh, messengers occasionally would have to pour water over those turtles to keep them from uh, drying out too much. And when I was a little girl, for example, what came by train were the little chickens that my mother raised. They came in boxes. We had to pick them up at the freight house. They came a hundred in a box. And of course they were small and uh, we had to keep them from being chilled. So we'd have to take them into the offices in the morning early or in the evening when they'd come in, depending on which train they were going out on and where they were going. And uh, you have about 1,500 or 2,000 baby chicks in there, and they sure can do a lot of chirping and make an awful lot of racket. And what came by train were our Christmas boxes, a, a, a Christmas order that might have our new underwear in it and, and some chocolates and some things that mother wouldn't let us look at because they were presents. One thing I remember too, we hauled cadavers down for the university hospital. And this one particular time, why, uh, we, uh, there was a man on the other end of the uh, pine box and I on the back end, and he was pulling on it and lifting. It was pretty heavy uh, pine box and the nails broke loose and out slid the cadaver right on top of him. And uh, I haven't seen this man since. In the days before radio and television, entertainment as often as not involved trains, especially for people living in the country. Trains took people on visits and vacations. Special low-priced excursion trains carried them to fairs and football games and popular resorts. Trains also brought in excitement. Performers and politicians, salesmen and evangelists. And watching the chugging trains and the goings-on at the depots was an entertainment in itself. One of the things that the Postal people are very proud of was the coming of Ringling Brothers Circus to Postville. That happened way back in 1915. The people for miles around came to Postville to watch the unloading of the giant circus train, the elephants, the tigers, the lions, and what have you. By the same token, when Malvern which had its county fair, and it was a big deal every year. And they had a 10-day Chautauqua in the summer. And a lot of people tented out there on the grounds and stayed all 10 days. Uh, people from here wanted to go to those things, so the train would run a special and take Tabor people up for all the uh, programs, the entertainment that Malvern had. And one of the big things that they liked to do was to take a whole Sunday off and go way up to the watering hole of the west, good old Clear Lake, where they could listen to some fancy sermons and uh, uh, some speakers and have fun on the sand and have a little water and whatever. Another thing that I remember vividly was uh, the Warren G. Harding uh, funeral train. They didn't actually stop here, but uh, we knew that they were going to go pretty slow, and they sure did. But uh, every kid in school was allowed to go along. The teachers brought us all down. We walked down here to the to the uh, track, and the train went real slow, and the, the body of Warren G. Harding was in that train. And uh, so we, we got to stand there quite a while and watch the thing go through. There was kind of decorated with flags and bunting and this and that. So we had a half an hour off from school. That was fun. 
The little towns were isolated. The young people didn't have too much to entertain them. So what they might do in, uh, in the evening, a friend was telling me this other day, she said, what we did in Sumner was to go down to the station and watch the train come in and wave at the engineer and buy an ice cream cone. And that was our entertainment. And whenever a passenger train or a train showed up, people were around to watch them. And it, it was a life that, that uh, they were always someone going places. There was a new life on the other side of the hill. When times got tough, some of the folks who went looking for a new life over the hill couldn't afford to pay the fare. Back in the good old days, when Herbert Hoover was elected president of the United States, we had the Depression. The railroads was loaded down with bum after bum after bum. There is a difference between your hobo and your bum. Your hobo works for a living. He will do anything he can to help you or to even for a meal. A bum is a bum. He's a moocher. He doesn't work, he isn't going to work, and he's not, never has. He just simply asks and is given. But your bum, he comes up to the house and, well, I want a little, I want a meal. Will you give me a meal? Well, we never turned them down either, but we would rather be more with the hobos. And when I started in the salvage business, I used to hire bums and things to work for me that come off in the trains. And every time they would see a car sitting here, they would come over and say, George, how about a job? And I'd give him a job. And he'll tell you that he'll split wood or he'll sharpen a knife or he'll sharpen your scissors and you think maybe it isn't a little eerie to sit there and see some scraggly guy in a long rundown condition with a little whetstone sharpening a knife so it, uh, it could cut your throat at any minute. Well, they never did. And, many, and since they're willing to work, many a bow has been given a hoe and showing the row in the garden, and he'll hoe, and he'll drink your coffee, and he'll thank you, and he's very pleasant with all. Another bum stopped in here one time, and when he stopped in here, he said, George, I'm going to start fixing shoes. He went over my, way, he went over my yard, and he made a shoe last, and he made it out of a railroad rail, and that's the way... He, he made his money. I got a shoe a, a sole in my building that cost 15 cents for a half sole, and he used to put them half soles and half show, soles for people going through the country, and he carried a thing like this with him. And so the bums, they was all educated, was some kind, they had some kind of a professional years ago. Uh, they would quote you poetry. They would talk of Longfellow. They would talk of Washington Irving. Uh, and believe it or not, they even knew current events, and you wondered how they knew all this. And then there were others who would just tell you what was going on in Kansas. And they would tell you what happened in Oklahoma. They would tell you about going through Illinois. And then there were those who wouldn't talk at all, and you left them alone because they wanted to live in their own little world. Just leave them where they're at and not bother them. Yeah, I was born up here, just another house over there. And uh, around here, this has all been my playground. My dad never told me to stay away from the tracks because I was born close to the tracks. Uh, youngsters like to play tricks on the train, and it was told that some of the youngsters who lived nearby would uh, grease the rails, especially on a big cut where the train had to go real steep and could hardly make the grade, especially if it was hauling a big load of cattle and coal. And so when it get on that steep pitch, the wheels would just spin. And of course, the youngsters were convulsed. They just got that, it was so funny. But the engineer would back it up a few rods and then make a run for it with the throttle wide open. And of course, he made the grade all right. Right over there, that tank would run over quite often. And uh, in the winter time, that that made a nice, nice uh, place to skate and go sledding. And we played around there a lot. And as we lived right along the railroad track, we had to cross that railroad track in order to get to school. School was about 
five blocks from our house. But I had to walk it. And the train would get on the track, taking on water. And one time I thought I was going to be late. So I crawled underneath the train. I glanced out the window to see if he was coming around the curve. And I could see his headlight shining around the curve. And right out about 150 or 75 feet east of the depot, right in the middle of the track, sat two little youngsters, about two and three years old. My old heart did a flip-flop, and I took off through the door as hard as I could go, and I started down the tracks. And I didn't think that I could ever make that in front of that train. We used to have races on the top of the boxcars when there were four or five were together at the elevator while we'd be run from one end to the other. That was a lot of fun. I grabbed those youngsters as I got to them. I was afraid to holler because there was too much noise they couldn't hear because of the machinery around the area. I grabbed the youngsters by each shoulder and we flew off into the side of the railroad tracks just about 30, about three or four seconds before the train went by. And the engineer was sitting up in the cab shaking his head. And I was so scared that I couldn't hardly get up off the ground to take those youngsters home. When I crawled under the train, I got to the other side. There was the brakeman and the depot agent, and they both grabbed me, and they said, don't you ever, ever do that again. Uh, we had several loads of uh, Black Angus cattle come in from the west, and uh, while we were unloading the cattle out of the cars down the chute, we forgot to close a, a gate uh, in the stockyards here, and uh, we had Black Angus cattle running all over Dyersville. Now, speaking of cattle, they were very, very important to us on Tom Oaks Farm. My father was a Holstein breeder. We had to take good care of the cows and the calves. And for example, one thing that my brother and I were asked to do in the summer when the pasture was short was to herd the cattle on the, on the, uh, along the road, the grassy spots along the road. And the train crossed the road, so we had that train crossing. The thing we were to watch more than anything was to keep the cows off the track. Unfortunately, uh, some of the cattle got out on the Chicago Great Western tracks and were run over and were killed in the, uh, in the process. Occasionally we'd have a sow or get out on the uh, right of way. Remember now, railroad run right up along here, right where the roadway is. And uh, we'd have a sow get out and trains don't stop for anything. They'd kill it because every train had a cow catcher, a snowplow shed thing that would scoop up a cow, toss it into the ditch, dead cow, train okay. Farmer, I'm just in great pain. People think that the bums, when they traveled on the railroad, there wasn't danger. There was lots of danger on the railroad. There was lots and lots of danger. The Great Western, although it traveled lots of prairie, it was up and down, many hills. And uh, they were climbing one of these hills, and the water just tipped enough to let the crown sheet get partly cleared. And uh, when a crown sheet gets uncovered and then water is applied, it's a total explosion. For some reason or another, they switched the carload of grain out on the eastbound track in front of number 10. Number 10 was right on time, and so was number 1. Number 10 hit it and knocked it over on the east or westbound track in front of number 1. Number 1 hit it, and, and all the engine on number 1 went off, and the baggage cars and mail cars on number 1, and also on number 10. All of a sudden, the brakes went into emergency, and when they did, I looked down on the uh, where my conductor desk was, and M.R. Schiller was laying on a desk there, trying to get some sleep, or anyway, laying down. And I could see him reaching out, grabbing for something to get a hold of, because the caboose was jerking him like that when we was in this derailment. And he, he ended up on his knees, laying on top of the seat there, still reaching and grabbing for space. The engine itself did not tip over, but the tender and the uh, caboose tipped over on their sides. 
prior to that, I knew something was happening, so I got up out of my seat alongside the boiler in front of the fireman. I went over and stood on the deck uh, where the fireman shovels the coal from the tender to the engine. And the fireman saved my life. He never said a word. He, he grabbed me by the arm, and I, uh, I went back up and sat down. And when everything came to a halt, that deck was, the uh, sheet steel was standing straight up. There was four killed. There was t the engineer and the fireman, two engineers, firemen, and hobo. Hobo was riding rods on number one. 1933 is when the steam passenger engine blew up coming into the Omaha station, and parts of that went clear out on the 10th Street viaduct. For those of you who are familiar with Omaha, at Tiffin, Iowa, and I'm sure most people in Iowa know where that is, it's on the Rock Island Railroad. One day, a freight train of fruit was passing through that town uh, at the depot, and it consisted mostly of oranges. And for some reason, the refrigerator car ahead of a dead-end engine, which is being transferred to the repair shops in Rock Island, decided to leave the group. It went through the depot. It pinned the station agents against the far wall, and that poor guy wasn't hurt much, but I'm telling you, he was almost drowned in orange juice. The James Gang pulled their first train holdup in Iowa, just outside of Adair. Even though Jesse James robbed trains and murdered railroaders, he became a hero of folk ballads and dime novels. To Midwesterners in the late 1800s, the railroads were the real bad guys. The profiteering industrialists who ran the railroads, the so-called robber barons, boosted freight rates mercilessly, squeezing every penny they could from farmers who had no other means to get their crops to market. At the same time they were reaping million dollar dividends, they were cutting workers' wages, often below the subsistence level. By the early 1900s, both groups had won better treatment from the railroads. But the railroads never lost the aura of big business, especially to the people who relied upon them for jobs and to carry their produce to market. So in the past, when minority workers were exploited, and today, when branch lines are closed and jobs cut back, it's hard not to blame the people in charge. We never could advance in the jobs as if we were qualified. I remember one time I asked the superintendent in Fort Madison, I says, how about me getting a, a helper job or, or a full pay job? And he was trying to walk away from me. I said, listen, I says, I, I, I understand that you're busy, but so am I. But I just want, want to know how come I have never been given an advancement. People below me have been advanced, they're, they're white, the Anglos, and, and I've been here working here several years. I would like to have an advancement. I can do any kind of work. I'm qualified. And you know what he said to me? He said, the world was not made in a day. I, I was so bitter, I call them names. And I didn't give a darn. I said, I'll go to the office if you want me fired. I, don't, I do not care. Back when I first started on railroad, the railroad was a lot much safer. It was operated by railroad men at that time. The, the entire system was had railroad was interested in a railroad to keeping it up in the best shape they could for the safety of that public and the passengers and, and what they hauled. And then, then as time went on, especially about 1955 or something like that, or on, it got to be big business, big bankers, big financiers got involved in railroad and, and took them over. They want to eliminate the short hauls, they want to go strictly long haul, and they've eliminated a lot of their branch lines where a lot of their good old customers lived, and uh, they did it in a, sometimes in a very ruthless manner when it came down to uh, say, well, you're not producing us enough business, we can't serve you any longer. All they were interested in was in making a fast buck out of it, getting by as cheap as they could in maintenance. They took the money that the railroads themselves had earned and placed it in something else when it should have been plowed back into the facility to keep it in operation. And I think it's a sad day for 
the American public that we can't have that today. young man, he had a few drinks in him and he's feeling his oats, I suppose, and he walked down the aisle and he saw this chick sitting over there on that side and looked at her and he looked very nice, but he went back about six seats and got a seat. Next time I went back there, he was sitting alongside of this young lady and talking in her ear and, and I said, this young man here, it's your invitation or request. And she said, certainly not. Well, I said, buddy, when they sold you that ticket in Chicago, they sold you a ticket for transportation, not for inspiration. If you want to get to Fort Dodge, get back in your seat and stay there, or else you won't get it, you won't make it to Fort Dodge. But what I really think about at the, and the train when I was a girl is the fact that it was so close. From the age of three, I always heard the sound of trains, the romantic sound, the old trains, the steam whistles would really bring you right up sharp with attention. And we would wave at the engineers as they went by across the, the field. And when my brother and I would have a little time to go fishing, mother let us go fishing when our work was done, we would go to the railroad bridge above the pool in the Volga River, and we could sit on the bank just under the edge of the bridge and fish for the sunfish, which was what we were looking for. And sometimes the train went over the bridge when we were on it, and the bridge would shake, and the noise was so scary, and we loved it. The curve is so situated as it comes around the corner, uh, the lights at the night go right into your bedroom and you'll swear it's broad daylight. Well, that light was a barring down and that whistle howling, and you just know there's the worst storm coming out of the southwest that ever happened in this world. And then you suddenly realize that it was a train going on down the line. About 1910 or 15, uh, or at least by 1920, there was so much talk of uh, hard surface roads and trucks. Cars had become to be real popular. When the train started, there were very, very few cars. It was all horse and buggy But uh, back in the 90s. But now there were cars and the hard surface roads. And uh, Mr. McClellan, who was a shrewd businessman, I think saw the handwriting on the wall, and he knew that the days of making money were at its end. Americans still love the open road, but by the 50s and 60s, that usually meant the highway, not the railway. Wanderers were more often hitchhikers than hobos. Travelers usually took the family car, and the mail moved by pavement and air instead of by rail. The fellow who was a, became the head of the postal department was a former General Motors officer, and he wanted to get General Motors equipment handling the U.S. mail, and that's why the U.S. mail hit the highways. Passenger trains had long depended on the income from mail cars to remain profitable. When the mail left the railroads, passenger service deteriorated, conductors and ticket agents were laid off. With the mail and passenger service gone, railroads were able to consolidate their business on a few major lines. They had the yards in there, had a roundhouse, they had rip tracks, they had uh, icing facilities for the refrigerator cars, they had operators and agents and yard foremans, and, and uh, now there's nothing there but <laughs> But just trains go through there anymore, nothing. Most local railroads, branch lines as they were called, were closed down. In Iowa, in just the last decade, more than 3,000 miles of track have been abandoned. Now, 
everything is gone. There are no more operators, there's no more depots, and that when I left here in uh, 1980, they closed the station, I was the only personnel between uh, Newhall, Iowa, and Collins, Iowa, a distance of about 60 miles or better, handling all the traffic all alone.